On Friday the 25th of February 1631, King Charles I and the Royal Court gathered in the chapel of the long-lost Palace of Whitehall to hear a sermon, as was customary on a Friday during Lent. The sermon was delivered by a preacher called Dr John Dunn, who is then the Dean of St Paul's, the head of the chapter of London's Great Cathedral. He had preached before the King and before his father, King James I, on many occasions before, but this sermon would prove to be his last. For John Dunn was gravely ill and had risen from his bed to attend the King. Five weeks later, he would lie dead upon it. John Dunn was an extraordinary man in a golden age that created many glittering stars. He was a person who had a history, so to speak. His life story and his death could easily grace the pages of a novel, and it would make a rather wonderful film. So who should we cast in the role? Uh, Johnny Depp as John Dunn? Um, Dr Dunn did have a certain Captain Jack Sparrow vibe going on in his younger years. In his youth, Dunn had been an aspiring lawyer, but his real passion in life was for poetry, and he continued to write prolifically throughout his life. From that poetry, we can learn a lot about the man. He was one of those poets that Samuel Johnson called the metaphysical poets, for they used metaphor, conceit, and wordplay extensively in their works. Dunn's Early poetical works were primarily erotic in nature and were mostly unpublished, and he used metaphor to the full. His most well-known poem, The Flea, which he wrote in the 1590s when he was a young law student at Lincoln's Inn, is perhaps the most well-known example of this genre. It's just the sort of work that Dr Johnson despised. In it, a young man tries to convince a young woman to have sexual intercourse with him by comparing their situation positively to the action of a blood-sucking opportunistic flea, something early modern people were all too used to. It is a multi-layered and off-the-wall metaphor in which the fictional protagonist uses the flea's behaviour as a vehicle to explore the moral rights and wrongs of acting on sexual instinct. It wasn't obvious in the 1590s that the young man who wrote this work and other similarly erotic works would one day direct his talents in a more spiritual direction as a churchman. He made his way to that profession through a very circuitous route, through military service and then through politics. My new website is up and running and through it you can subscribe to my monthly magazine, The Antiquary. I've got a bit of an offer available for the digital edition of the magazine for the next week. If you subscribe to the digital issue, you will get the first month free. It will give you a taster of what the magazine is all about. People who receive it really do enjoy it. Why not give it a go? There's no contract or obligation and you can stop a subscription at any time. But if you like the channel, you will love the magazine. In it, I explore even more of the curios and less travelled avenues of history. Follow the link that is above and below and use the code antiquary at checkout and you'll get your first issue free at the beginning of October. Although this video is primarily about Dr Dunn's death and his very unusual monument, it is important to say something about his life and his experience if we are to understand why he has such a curious tomb. In the later 1590s, after his law studies, he decided to go off on a bit of an adventure and he signed up to fight in the Anglo-Spanish Wars. He served with Sir Walter Raleigh and the Earl of Essex and he was present at the sacking of Cadiz in 1596. Returning from his adventures, like many young men with romantic ideals, he realised he couldn't live on thin air and he went to work in the royal court and was for a time the chief secretary to Sir Thomas Edgerton, who was the Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. That seems to go quite well until his heart gets the better of his head, and he falls in love with Edgerton's niece, Anne Moore. Edgerton and the Moore family do not approve of the match, and Dunn loses his job, and he receives a spell in the Fleet Prison for his pains. However, his heart was right, and the marriage, which was a real love match, endured the displeasure of the bride's family, and Anne would give birth to 12 children. In 1602, after a quiet retirement for a while in the countryside, Dunn is elected as the Member of Parliament for Brackley. The following year, in 1603, after the death of Queen Elizabeth I, 
there is a regime change and Dunn soon finds favour with the new Scottish king, James I. And it is the king who first suggests to Dunn that he take on holy orders. Initially, he refuses as he considers himself unworthy of the role, but in 1615, he changes his mind and he is ordained. He finds a new outlet for his intellectual gifts and he becomes a very popular preacher. He mixes his two professions, the law and the church, and from 1616, the now Dr Dunn was a reader in divinity at Lincoln's Inn. In 1621, he was then appointed Dean of St Paul's. During these years, Dunn, in common with many in his age, experienced considerable personal loss. In 1617, his beloved wife Anne died after giving birth to their 12th child, who was stillborn. Anne had experienced several stillbirths over the years, and three of their children survived infancy, only to die before the age of 10. In November of 1623, John, now alone and looking after his children, suffered a near-fatal illness, probably typhus. And three years later, in 1626, his 18-year-old daughter Lucy also died. This life experience transformed Don from a young, passionate poet living in the moment into a deeply reflective middle-aged man, musing increasingly on the brevity of lifespan. Though plagued at times with melancholia due to these grave challenges, one thing was constant in his life. He did not lose his faith in Christ. When Dunn arrived at Whitehall on the 25th of February 1633 to deliver his sermon, he appeared before the king and the court as an image of human frailty. Dunn was emaciated, skeletal and very close to death. As his biographer Isaac Walton stated, he presented himself that day not to preach mortification by a living voice, but mortality by a decayed body and a dying face. The sermon, which we can read as it was later printed, is a reflection on life and on death. It portrays life as a slow descent from the very beginning into sickness and then to death. We have shrouds in our mother's womb, he stated. He talks of the inevitable corruption of the body, of vermiculation, of consumption by worms. Yet in life, he argues, there is always hope of redemption, salvation and resurrection through Christ. It is a very personal reflection on Dunn's experience of the past, his experience of his own illness and decline in the present, and his own enduring faith. It is important to understand this worldview if we are to truly understand the extraordinary monument that commemorates Dr Dunn. It can still be seen amid Christopher Wren St Paul's Cathedral. It is one of the most unusual funerary monuments of its age, and miraculously, it survived the Great Fire of London in 1666 that consumed the rest of St Paul's Cathedral and in which many of the monuments of the great and good perished. The story is that somehow it fell from the wall and torpedo-like, for it is shaped rather like a torpedo, it fell into the crypt. It remained in the crypt until the 19th century when it was refixed on the wall close to the site it originally occupied. The monument shows Dr Dunn dressed ready to be placed in his grave, with his burial shroud covering his body, revealing only his face. The monument was carved by the king's master mason, Nicholas Stone, but Dunn gave instructions for its form and style before he died. Dunn had been persuaded to order a monument to himself by his physician, Dr Simeon Fox, who lived in the close of St Paul's. In the end, Fox would be the major contributor to the fund that paid for it, and the monument was commissioned from Stone by Dunn's colleague and executor, Dr King. Isaac Walton tells the story of how the concept for the monument came about, and it was entirely Dunn's idea. Some weeks before he died, he sent for a carver to make him a wooden urn, and aboard the height of his body. Several charcoal fires were then lit in Dunn's study. He took off all his clothes and he put upon him his burial shroud, which was then tied at the top and the bottom, as was customary. And he then stood on top of the urn in his shroud, 
with his eyes closed and the shroud turned back so that all that could be seen, says Walton, was his lean, pale and death-like face. He apparently stood in the study on this urn for quite some time, with his face turned towards the east from whence Christ will come again, while a painter produced a life-size portrait of him. He then had the painting placed beside his bed, where it remained for him to gaze upon until he died. The painting was also copied, and this engraving of it was produced and printed as the frontispiece of his sermon Death's Duel when it went to the press the following year. And then Nicholas Stone used the painting as the inspiration for his carved monument, which was finally put up in the South Choir Isle of St Paul's, a stone's throw from his stall in the choir of the medieval cathedral. Dunn must have been influenced by other monuments he'd seen, both in St Paul's and elsewhere, for the monument is of a genre called Memento Mori that were popular in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Dunn's monument, when first erected in 1633 in Old St Paul's, was placed directly beside that of an earlier dean of St Paul's, Dr John Collett, the humanist scholar. Dunn would have seen this monument daily. Collett's Memento Mori was of a rather more conventional type. It is a type called a transi tomb. Transi meaning to pass over, as it portrays the person commemorated as one who has passed over, is dead. And it was a type that became popular in the early 15th century for powerful churchmen. Collet's lost monument was by Pietro Torrigiano, who created the monument for King Henry VII in Westminster Abbey. And a bust of Collet, shown as he was in life, looked down upon a representation of his own skeleton laid out on a mat. Dunn's monument also started something of a fashion for effigies of this sort. At East Barsham in Norfolk is an extraordinary monument of a young woman called Mary Calthorpe. Her monument, carved by London sculptors John and Matthias Christmas, shows Mary in her shroud rising from the dead on the last day, her face turned towards the east from whence Christ will come. And at Newington in Oxfordshire is a monument of circa 1650 to Walter Dunch and his wife, also by a London workshop. It shows half figures of Mr and Mrs Dunch with their eyes closed, dressed in their shrouds, set within wreaths, as part of a larger elaborate tablet. Dunn's monument was originally erected, it seems, so that his face turned towards the east, and it had on it a Latin inscription that Dunn himself penned, that addresses the viewer here, although in falling ashes, he looks upon him whose name is rising. Despite the turbulence and the difficulties of his life, Dunn expressed to the very end, in the face of his own bodily decay and his own mortality, a faith in the power of the resurrection of Christ. And this is expressed in the monument. Thanks very much for watching. Mm -hmm.